and, and rudimentary, to be honest with you. My guess uh, is that when you actually run the game client, you essentially give it permission to be able to, you know, capture other active processes and stuff. My guess is they probably have something on their blacklist of processes that they're getting confused with something else. So like, for example, you can get banned just for having cheat engine open, even if it's not attached to a game, because it's a resident process, the VAC system will pick up on it and will ban you automatically. Um, yeah, don't, don't open that. Uh, or, I mean, and honestly, their list of applications, they're never going to share them. Um, but it could be anything, even as simple as like HXD or something like that. I mean, if you're if you're doing homework for your cybersecurity class, or your I'm sorry, cybersecurity student. Okay, yeah. If you if you uh, play around with that kind of stuff, you know, if you're not in a VM, it can pick up on that kind of stuff, and it's just. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, so he might have all kinds. He might he might have Visual Studio on there. That might be it. I mean, it shouldn't be, and hopefully they correct it, but yeah, it could be something as that. Hmm. Right. No. There's... Right, yeah, it's putting you in the, in the queue for those, yeah. Yeah, or it could be something that's their fault too. Like if it's a beta version and you're playing on that, if they push a file, let's say that they have a hash list of all the files that are supposed to be in the directory, but then they do an update and they push out a new version or something like that, and it's not in their hash list, it might be banning users because they're pushing it up before they're updating their hash list. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there certainly could be. It would require, you know, some kind of organized effort or something. They're not gonna, they're not gonna admit to wrongdoing or making a mistake unless they have to. Yeah, that'll teach them. <laughs> that'll teach them. <laughs> All right. So we have uh, a little bit more left here um, on freedom of speech, and uh, then we're gonna move on to. Uh, digital citizenship. Oh, technically not free speech. I mean, a little bit more on freedom of speech, but we also still got to talk about the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, as far as constitutional rights go. Uh, so when we left off last time, uh, we were talking about discourse online, about how uh, we live in a time uh, that is simultaneously ancient and new, and so we can have these immutable laws that seem as old as the internet itself, such as Godwin's Law, and yet the people who are responsible, the eponymous Godwin in this case, is still around to hand down their wisdom from on high. Now, whereas when the internet was first new, uh, the prevailing wisdom online essentially was that fascism was a thing of the past, that it was a passe and facile sort of political ideology, uh, one that could never take root in an era like the internet when we had true egalitarianism and freedom of ideas and that kind of a thing. And then we saw the fruits of that egalitarianism, that free exchange of ideas in certain places, like for example, the Arab Spring. And then quickly afterwards, we saw a vicious clampdown by those that stood to lose from a change in the status quo and a rise in fascism. And so while on the early internet, it became something of a joke with Godwin's law that calling somebody a Nazi was a magic I win the argument button, you know, you're a Nazi, therefore I'm correct kind of a thing. Uh, over time, the joke definitely wore thin as actual Nazis came out of the woodwork more and more online, leading to a somewhat less ironic representation such as this. And then Godwin himself coming out of the woodwork to say, oh, no, no, this is fine. You can go ahead and call these people Nazis. Because last time we were talking about restricted speech, things that the U.S. government can do. Uh, to prevent speech online and elsewhere, a very limited case where they can regulate content, but mostly within their purview, the time, place, and manner of speech. And most of that not applying to the internet in general because it's all private property and sites tend to be, thanks to section 230, um, classified as distributors rather than publishers, making them not liable for any content on their sites for the most part. 
And so regulation of things like this, and there have been social media sites that have gone out of their way, of course, to eliminate what they consider to be hate speech on their site. They're no, no they're not legally obligated to do so, right? They do so because uh, they, I suppose there's various different schools of thought on exactly why they do it, huh? But honestly, the safest bet is because they would be less profitable if they did not, right? And that is the motivating factor here. They are businesses after all. But that does raise a question, right? We have restricted speech, we have free speech. We also have dangerous or undesirable speech, which does not meet the burden for obscenity, uh, but yet which is undesirable online and so therefore is often cleared out. We saw this gentleman's picture here earlier this semester alongside other such notorious peoples as Elliot Rogers and so on. Uh, this here is Lane Davis. Uh, before we talk about Lane here, uh, very recently there was a win in terms of the Sandy Hook victims. You may have heard that Alex Jones contributor to InfoWars, radio personality, and then some, um, <laughs> thanks largely to a series of legal missteps on his behalf more than anything else, uh, was recently found culpable because this is a civil case, not guilty. He was found culpable or responsible for um, violations of civil liberties of the Sandy Hook victims survivors. And so was by the court charged to pay nearly a billion dollars in damages. Now, in that case, if you've been following it all, uh, you might realize that uh, that billion dollars coming from Jones is only in part for his speech. If you haven't been following it, then the short version is that the Sandy Hook victims and survivors of those victims alleged violations of their civil uh, rights in part due to conduct actually by others. So essentially they've said that they were harassed online and in person. People would come to their house shouting conspiracy theories. People would piss on their children's graves and all manner of terrible things, but none of those, any of them alleged were actually done by Jones himself. Instead, they alleged that he, using his position as a broadcaster, relayed a message that was facile and untrue and recall that one of the limitations of free speech is uh, def uh, defamation, slanderous or libelous speech is restricted. And so he was found responsible for that. Now that is again, a civil case, not a criminal case. Um, Alex Jones made something of an effort to argue on free speech grounds that he was allowed essentially to say whatever he wanted. But again, this is a well-known, well-trod exception to what is considered free, it must be regulatory, regulated speech, restricted speech. So in that case, Jones essentially is paying the price for his speech and the speech inspired by him and the followers of his show. And one hopes at least that it sends a message to other broadcasters out there. But Jones is by no means and never has been alleged to be the ringleader of all dangerous uh, speech online, not by a long shot. And it's only in this case that we actually have someone potentially to blame for all of this. Now back once again here, Mr. Davis. Now Mr. Davis uh, is an example of a person uh, who engaged in and conducted what would be considered undesirable or dangerous speech, but not as such to be restricted. He was an avid user of a social media site known as Reddit, builds itself as the front page of the internet, and in particular would post dozens and dozens of times a day spreading conspiracy theories like Pizzagate. And if you're not familiar with Pizzagate, I think I mentioned it earlier this semester, but Pizzagate is a conspiracy theory that high level Democrats within the Democratic Party in the United States uh, engaged in uh, child human trafficking and abuse in a pizza parlor that, or sorry, in the basement of a pizza parlor that does not have a basement. Um, now, he was not banned. Uh, no, in fact, what happened was, uh, is he posting dozens of times a day on Reddit about conspiracy theories, had something of a difficult time adjusting to normal society. Uh, he was, if you recall, our unit on solipsism syndrome, essentially terminally online at that point, and would spend all day basically just posting about this and spreading other conspiracy theories and engaging with other people that 
uh, social bond, the uh, social reinforcement factor, the lack of stigma because of living in essentially in a virtual world, so on and so forth, except for the only people he really had contact with, which were his parents. This was in California, and the uh, parents here in this case availed themselves of the predominant political ideology of the area. They were essentially West Coast hippies. And they did not really much care for their son's political ideology. Um, but being parents allowed them to, allowed him rather, uh, to stay in their house, to live well into his 30s, posting online and so on, until eventually they'd had enough of hearing about these conspiracy theories and told them that it was time to grow up, get a job, move out, and get a life, that kind of thing. And uh, he did not much care for their political ideology, seeing them at this point so terminally online as essentially the enemy. And so in response to that, he murdered both of them. Now, one wonders when one goes online exactly who all these people are who are posting all of this stuff to poll or uh, the Donald or what have you. And uh, as we learned with space transition theory, at least the answer more often than not, are people just like you and me that we meet every day, all day, throughout our lives. And they don't seem to give us uh, any indication that they are harboring at all any latent malevolent traits of any kind. But the uh, idea, uh, the thing that everyone calls all of these people online, of course, the basement dwelling neckbeard, social maladaptives, and so on, well, every once in a while that proves to be true. Right, And that's really the problem with dangerous speech, and that's really why social media sites like Reddit now take steps to restrict that speech, even though they're not necessarily legally obligated to do so, uh, because it's just bad press to be associated with. Right? Now, as far as regulating that speech goes, is it a violation of free speech? Well, we did talk about a case not that long ago or someone who actually had been convicted of a crime. And the Supreme Court did take up the case, Lester Packingham Jr., uh, in which he could not be restricted from using social media because as the public forum, the state could not regulate access to that content. So as a condition of probation in this case, could not be prevented from using a computer in order to access social media. And we talked about Andrew Tate last week, and isn't that precisely what's happening here? Why would a convicted sex offender have uh, rights that uh, an individual in this nation that has not otherwise been accused of or convicted of any crime have? Or why would somebody like this, uh, Mr. Davis here, be banned for dangerous speech preemptively? Or, I mean, there's an even more famous case, of course, right? I don't think, uh, I don't think that the Donald himself has yet been unbanned from social media sites. Well, that's what we're talking about here because the problem with dangerous speech online is that if it's not restricted for every person out there that's in on the joke, there's gonna be at least one, but probably more people that aren't and will take it seriously. And so I present to you yet another eponymous law of the internet as Pose Law, which essentially says that when we're talking about anything online, but particularly salient when it comes to dangerous or undesirable speech, is the idea that no matter how much of a joke it seems to be, Somebody will take it seriously and we'll run with it. And my exhibit in this case, as we talked about before here, is this goddamn frog. This is the living embodiment of Poe's law. Okay, it's not living, but you know what I mean. This frog is on the Southern Poverty Law Center's list of hate symbols alongside the swastika, and the black sun and the iron cross and the stars and bars and so on. This frog was not invented to be a hate symbol. It was adopted as a joke. It was adopted because it's so dumb. The idea was that nobody in their right mind, key here being their right mind, could possibly believe that this thing was a hate symbol. By the way, this is where it comes from. The creator, Matt Fury, in this case, had a series of comic strips that they made available online, and they were silly, you know, uh, but certainly no white supremacist intentions whatsoever with this. It's just a silly cartoon. Feels good, man.
it's legal enough. So it was adopted as a joke because no one could possibly believe that this innocent cartoon frog could have anything to do with any of that. Other examples, everyone remember the, uh, everyone remember the uh, deal with the symbol, the OK symbol? Again, same deal, same place, as a matter of fact, on the image boards. Hey, let's see if we can get people to think that this is a white supremacist uh, gesture. And they did. But then it stopped being a joke because of Poe's laws when actual white supremacists didn't realize that it was a joke and started doing it for real. So now you have all kinds of photos of actual white supremacists making this gesture, meaning for it to be like an in-joke thing. And that's the issue with uh, undesirable or dangerous speech. I, uh, I prefer not to use the term dangerous because what precisely is you know, danger in this case? Well, we're gonna talk about that when we get to digital citizenship, I suppose. But the idea is, is that all of these messages being conveyed online in one way or another can be easily memefied uh, and uh, can eventually find their way in front of a person who is influenced by it. All right, let's talk about threats here, for example. Now threats are not protected speech. They are considered to be restricted, which is why so much dangerous or undesirable, I'm just gonna use undesirable speech. I don't like dangerous speech, I keep saying it. Let's say undesirable speech and undesirable in the sense of not even necessarily it's damage to society, but to the potential uh, that it may cause a, uh, if you're working in cybersecurity, a, a future potential principal, or if you're just a user of online services, one of your service providers may cause them issues with such speech. speech. So threats are not part of that, which is why such undesirable speech it makes it, um, well, one of the, the factors, the hallmarks of it is that it avoids direct threats at all costs. You know, they won't say, um, let's uh, kill the vice president. They'll just say something like he's, uh, gallows don't require electricity or something, right? But again, Poe's law, even that speech eventually finds its way in front of somebody who doesn't quite understand it and will come out and say, yeah, let's murder the vice president. And then everyone's like, oh, no, we're not associated with them. Um, so anyway, yeah, threats. Um, what constitutes a threat depends on who's making it, who it's made to, and it's another reasonable person standard, meaning that the goalpost for what cons constitutes a threat changes all the time. And uh, it's a good example here. So. Back in 1994, when the internet was young, there was this case, U.S. v. Alcabaz, or Jake Baker, as he was known offline. Now, Jake was a student at a university, the University of Michigan, and he liked to write stories and share them, and they were stories about his classmates. Now, when these came to light, because he had been sharing them with another student, not one featured in the stories, just another connoisseur of fan fiction, I suppose, in this case. Um, he was picked up because somebody who was featured in the stories complained to the school, who contacted the police, and he was arrested and charged with violations of the Interstate Communications Statute, 18 U.S.C. 875C. Now, when it went to court, it was ruled that this was not a violation because according to their reading of that statute is that unless it has sent to somebody, in this case, somebody else forwarded it to them, that it was not a violation because no threat was being made direct. Sure, it featured them and it featured them by name and sure, they found that the story itself was objectionable, but it wasn't a threat in any fashion according to their reading of the statute because the email messages linking to the stories was a private conversation between Baker and a friend named Gandhi. Now contrast this with other things that have been considered threats lately, like for example, Alonis v. United States, who was convicted and, well, was arrested, charged, and then later convicted of making threats against his wife and a federal agent because of posts he made online. 
In this case, they weren't sent directly to anybody, but they were published to the public via social media, styling himself like Eminem. For example, considering himself a future rap superstar, uh, posted to social media the lyric, there's one way to love you, but a thousand ways to kill you, et cetera, et cetera, and made the argument that that's not so different from what Eminem does. And Mama said she was uh, wants to show how far she can float, and don't worry about that little boo on her throat, and so on. And then when confronted by the FBI over these posts, uh, made nice with the agent, and then as soon as she left, posted again on Facebook that he was going to kill the agents. Right? Now, in this case, Alonis, again, was convicted of this because even though they weren't sent, like Baker, directly to the victims, well, they were published publicly, but then why isn't Eminem also getting arrested for that? Well, it's context. You can make a direct threat on an album that's been published apparently to millions of people, but you can't do so by publishing it to millions of people yourself on social media. Of course, other threats are considered far more serious than others. Like for example, if anyone here has ever been tempted to threaten the president online, I can assure you that you will be getting a call from the Secret Service. You'll probably be getting a visit from the Secret Service. It's happened dozens and dozens of times throughout the history of the internet. And they definitely take that very seriously. Uh, libel and defamation, oh, I'm sorry, I guess we didn't cover that last time. Well, libel and defamation are also uh, considered to be uh, unprotected speech. And this is salient because the way that the internet works, of course, we're supposed to be able to share information, including information uh, that might be detrimental to another business. For example, if there's a a contractor that non-performs or something like that. But that's not necessarily the case because, oh, and I should say, if you're not familiar with, uh, with defamation is the umbrella term, libel is when it's written, slander is when it's spoken, but defamation applies in both cases, it's a term that applies regardless. Um, so for example, a Virginia woman was sued over her posts on uh, Yelp in this case, uh, <laughs> except she got out of it uh, because her defamation uh, was canceled out by the contractor's defamation. They got into a slap fight on Yelp. And so they both kind of just said, okay, you guys go your own ways. Whereas another woman in Arizona was actually found liable for $12 million in damages because of posts she made online criticizing consumers. So undesirable speech includes defamation. As long as you're careful about your defamation, the general rule of thumb being that if it's factual, then it's not defamation. It has to be harmful or it's not defamation. And you have to be liable for those statements, meaning that you have to have posted them or be responsible for posting them in order for it to be considered defamation. At the Depp Heard trial, there was uh, some um, back and forth about who had slandered or libeled who in that case. And in the one case where Amber Heard prevailed, um, that was an example of Depp's attorney making statements. So once again, someone else being found liable or responsible uh, for the speech of somebody else. Because in that case, a lawyer is acting on behalf of their client in the interest of their client. And ultimately, uh, well, that's why it's important to get a good lawyer. All right, let's talk about the Fourth Amendment, which if you're not familiar with, this is the amendment that protects you from unreasonable search and seizure, the one that requires that if you are to be searched, that there must be a warrant, and that warrant must be signed upon by a local magistrate and can only be done so with probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, this used to be not such a big deal back, of course, when it was written and uh, up until the age of the internet, because the idea of what is a place and thing were a lot more clear cut. A place, physically a place, a thing, physically a thing. But the court has struggled back and forth constantly on what constitutes a thing or place in a virtual environment. A computer system has been likened in some court cases to a file cabinet. And we kind of use that terminology too. That's why we have directories and files and so on. But how alike to a file cabinet is a computer system? Not at all, not even a little bit, not even close, right? 
So it used to be fine, right? If uh, in the old days, in the 1970s, if you were being investigated for being a commie, well, a place is where you're staying, a thing is what you're reading, your diary is a thing, and where you do your shopping is clearly a place. All of those clearly are effects and papers. But on a computer system, not all the data on there is even there with your knowledge. Not all of the data there is not easily copied, uh, transferred, transmitted, and so on. Um, is a single directory a place? Is the entire computer a case, a, a place, and so on? Uh, adding to that, the way that the uh, distributed communication network of the internet works means that your information, your effects, may reside in multiple different places. Like, for example, if you send an email, a copy of that email will transfer through the entire chain. And I can tell you, just cutting to the chase on this one, every single time I've ever done any kind of an investigation since 2000, um, there is always, not always a subpoena, but there's always a request at least that goes out to Apple or Google for your information when it comes to your um, accounts. And why is that? Because they have your information and they're always more than happy to comply with requests from law enforcement for additional information. Internet service providers, that's become much easier too. In the early days when there were smaller subscribers, they might sit on a, a subpoena request for a little while. Uh, these days, you know, Charter, TDS, and all the other major telecom companies, they have automated systems, which has been abused fairly recently by them. People who are sending uh, subpoena requests or, or fake hold requests, law enforcement hold requests for, for information, um, just sending them, putting the name of an agency on it with a different return address, and they just automatically get kicked back, and the next thing you know, they have all of your information. And I mean all, by the way, like your username, <laughs> if, you've got, uh, if you've got location services on your phone, all of that information, browsing history, um, uh, data analytics, um, metrics, and so on, all of that, all of that gets sent over. So um, yeah, everyone's aware of your activity. You're in a service provider, the service providers we use online, all of them have copies of information. Email servers will, of course, have a copy of emails and so on. And that's why if you're using privacy enhancing technologies such as VPNs, it's important to make sure that you shop around, don't use free ones and so on. Uh, because uh, if you do, well, it's probably operated by somebody you don't want operating it and having all of that information or uh, they you know, keep logs or something like that that eventually they provide to whoever asks for them. So important to do that. Uh, for example, um, last summer, I got an opportunity to work on a case contracted to do stylometric analysis on um, text messages uh, for an international drug trafficking case. And in that case, uh, they had all of that information because law enforcement um, was operating a fake messaging service. They billed it on the dark web as being a secure messaging service, more secure than competitors. And um, they operated it for something like five years, collecting all of that evidence, all of those messages. They went back and forth, including subscriber information and IP addresses and so on. Um, and then at the end of the five years, uh, brought the hammer down, caught, I think, 60 or 70 different people in the dragnet on that one, including a, a couple of different, because uh, it was operated on the dark web. So a couple of different drug rings and so on were all caught in that. Um, right, so yeah, if you're gonna use privacy enhancing services, make sure that you're careful about what you operate because you never know who's out there. If you're not familiar with privacy enhancing technologies, a VPN service basically is just a proxy that will proxy all of your web requests. So acting as an intermediary between you as the client and the end destination there, the um, connection between you and the VPN service will be encrypted. So your internet service provider will, will see that you're making a connection, but they won't be able to see exactly what is in it. Whereas if you use privacy enhancing technologies like Tor or I2P, it's more of an obfuscation method because you're essentially exiting through a bunch of relays that kind of hides where the initial one, uh, the initial request comes from. But keeping in mind that essentially at any one of these nodes, it's pretty easy to trace back the request. So really this relies on a lot of concurrent users mixing data than anything else. So if you use Tor 
for example, here online, uh, I mean, here at the university, uh, we can absolutely see your machine and the requests that you're making and easily connect to the two. It doesn't actually anonymize anything unless we have a couple dozen students using it all at once. Um, all right, privacy uh, obviously is part of the Fourth Amendment as well. We don't have an explicit right to privacy here in the United States. We never have. Um, we're getting there. Privacy laws are being introduced. Wisconsin had one introduced that I think was dropped. California has uh, the CCPA. Uh, here in Wisconsin, it's a mixed bag. Um, over in Europe, of course, they have the GDPR. They have an explicit right. Here in Wisconsin, we do have a privacy law, but pr primarily just like everybody else, we rely on the Fourth Amendment. Um, ostensibly, essentially, if the government does not have the right to just stop you and search you, then that's a right to some kind of privacy. It's known as an implied right. So um, yeah, here in Wisconsin, we have a mixed bag because we have some privacy laws, we have the Fourth Amendment, but we also have uh, crazy open records laws. So essentially here in Wisconsin, you have a right to privacy unless you have contact with any state agency and then you have no privacy. Because we have open records laws, which means like for example, uh, the Wisconsin circuit court access system um, around 20 years ago or so, um, came up with this computer system and digitized all of their paper records so that essentially you can go ahead and you can search whatever you like. Uh, where is it? Circuit court. Yep, I agree. I don't know what it says, but I agree. Okay, uh, let's see. Don't nobody volunteer. Uh, let's go with uh, uh, James, uh, first name, <laughs> uh, Charles. I don't know if there's Charles James anywhere in here, but let's try and find out. Yeah, sure there are. <clears throat> All right, so for example, uh, let's go over reverse filing date. Here we go. <laughs> Back in 1983, we can see that uh, James Bruce Charles, or sorry, Charles Bruce James, uh, in this case, in Milwaukee County, had himself a little bit of a legal issue, state of Wisconsin v. Charles Bruce James, going all the way back. And this is 1983, and this is going to be here forever. I always get a little worried when I click on the criminal cases, because God knows what this could possibly be, but sure, let's find out. Statute, oh God, this is a bad one. Uh, okay, no, it's not. <laughs> Operating a vehicle without the owner's consent. Thank God. Uh, all right, but we have, you know, history of charges. We have uh, all the court records associated with it. So, you know, Mr. Charles here, he's got, uh, he's got the right to privacy in the state of Wisconsin, but before he comes into contact with the state agency, like our court system, well, now he doesn't anymore. And so he has to live with that forever. Uh, also of note here in terms of your right to privacy is again, because it's an uh, amendment in the Bill of Rights, it only applies to the government. Technically speaking, private enterprises can request anything they want of you to use their services. And by the way, when you click the, you know, the accept all, that was a response to the GDPR in order to protect themselves from litigation in Europe. Um, but essentially what you're agreeing to in those cases is allowing them to do whatever they want with your data, just as they did before GDPR. So it's kind of not the same thing, except since you're not an EU citizen, if you were to contact them and ask them to get rid of your data, they simply won't. And also you should know that the incognito mode or the in private window or do not track or so on, uh, you should know that that means effectively nothing. You can still be tracked. You are still tracked, as a matter of fact. The only thing it does is it just doesn't store those cookies for later, as far as you know, and as far as they promise. But it still could. There's nothing stopping them from doing it. There's absolutely no law at all requiring that they do that or anything. So I guess just be aware of that. <laughs> 
Um, now things actually have been reeled back a little bit. Um, a fun game to play is if you pick uh, any house that you want, any address, randomly even, uh, see how much you can learn about it because there's gonna be lots of, uh, of real estate sites out there that will have pictures of the interior that will have the owner's name information, tax information, the sale prices. Also, because we're in Wisconsin, uh, particularly in Stevens Point, you can go to the tax assessor's website and you can look up any address and it will tell you permits that have been pulled. Um, uh, anytime somebody has died or it's been devalued or when there's additions been done to it, so on and so forth, essentially into perpetuity. That's how I found out my house is built by a bootlegger. I found his name, looked it up, and oh, that's where he got his money from. All right. Um, now, it has been reeled back a little bit because Google, of course, is, uh, is one of the key players in the data mining game. And they had themselves an idea at one point they wanted to really improve uh, their Google Maps features by adding a layer for Wi Fi signal propagation. And so, what they did is they had their Google car driving around essentially with a, <laughs> essentially with a rogue AP in it trying to connect to any SSID that was broadcast as it drove by <laughs> and then scanning it to get an idea of how many devices everyone was using in the house, just so they knew, you know, they've got eight computers in there, they got a couple of phones and so on. Uh, but they actually got sued over that one and, and had to reel it back. Uh, they were actually, uh, um, they were actually fined even under violations of the Wiretap Act. So that one got reeled back, at least for now. At least for now. I think it was the scanning part that really went too far because technically connecting to broadcasting SSIDs, I don't think that would be, itself be a violation. I think it's the scanning part that was a violation. All right, so that brings us to the uh, one of the few statutes that we have that actually protects your privacy online, the only one you really need to be concerned with unless, um, or if you're gonna be working in law enforcement. The ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, was passed in 1986 along with the Omnibus Crime, Back, uh, Crime Bill that would later become known as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this is the one that prevents law enforcement from being able, well, and Google for that matter, from being able to simply scan for devices or capture information and so on. All right. Which brings us to the Fifth Amendment. Now, the Fifth Amendment, if you're not familiar with it, you might be familiar with it from pop culture when everyone, uh, whenever someone is testifying on the, on the stand, they don't want to give information. They always say that they're going to plead the Fifth, which, of course, implies that they're guilty of something. Um, it's actually kind of an expansive amendment. It's the one that requires uh, that you must be charged with a crime, that there must be a grand jury for an, okay, uh, I'm not going to assume that you, that you, are only familiar with the legal process from police procedurals. So uh, to explain, um, when the police think that you've done something wrong, they cannot just arrest you. They must have what's known as probable cause, which means that they have evidence that a crime has been committed and sufficient reason to believe that you are responsible for that. When your arrest doesn't mean anything, usually you're arrested pursuant only to an investigation. They think you're responsible. They're collecting evidence to be sure. They can hold you for an, uh, just a finite amount of time, usually 48 hours, but it depends on when you're arrested and so on. Um, and if you're not charged with a crime at that point, you must be released. When you're charged with a crime, it means that the police have sufficient evidence and they essentially have proof that you did it. When you're charged, you're still not going to jail just yet. Okay, the investigation is still open. Being charged means that you go before a judge magistrate, the evidence is presented, and they say, okay, you have enough evidence to hold them. And it's not until a grand jury convenes in the case of criminal cases, a grand jury means that a group of individuals gets together, also reviews the evidence that the police have and believe that there is enough evidence that you reasonably could be believed to have committed the crime. You're still not guilty. The grand jury just says, okay, maybe they actually did do it. Then you are indicted. That's a bad thing. And then later on, you will go to your trial if you elect to have one or you know, accept a plea bargain and avoid trial, at which time the evidence will be presented, you will make your case, and then the trier of fact, either the judge or jury, will then determine whether or not you are guilty 
or innocent process known as conviction. So you are arrested, charged, indicted, convicted. It's an evolving process of provable facts. This is also the one uh, that has a bunch of other stuff about times of war, militia, and so on. But the one that we are really interested in for this case is, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And that's the one, of course, that gets trampled all over with the uh, process of what's known as civil forfeiture as well, but this is not a criminology class, so I'll skip that part. The real question as it pertains to technology use is what does this mean? Can you plead the fifth if asked, what is the password to your phone? The answer is, of course, as with all things with the legal system, it depends and it's complicated. So the Fifth Amendment does indeed protect you from incriminating yourself in the course of a criminal investigation, which means that you can refuse to provide your password under certain conditions. Something you know is protected by the Fifth Amendment, something you have is not, which means if you use a biometric lock on your phone, the police can take your fingerprint and can use it to unlock your password. They can do the same thing with palm vein scans, with iris readers, facial uh, uh, recognition, uh, and so on. These are all things you have. It's one of the factors of authentication, something you have. Just like if you wrote it down on a note, they can seize the note, use the password on the note to unlock the phone or whatever. Something only you know is protected. So you can't be forced to divulge a password that only exists in your head. But this isn't always the case. For example, uh, there have been several cases, and we'll look at one in just a second here, where if you know something, but it's not a process of investigation, it's a process of discovery, then it's different. There's also um, interesting implications to this because what is otherwise protected medical data, um, PHI in this case, for an arsonist uh, that had a pacemaker, so a pacemaker is something he has, but his heartbeat, I suppose, in this case was argued that is also something he has, but still is very personal medical information, uh, was used against him as the elevated uh, heart rate during the fires uh, was circumstantial evidence in his involvement in said fires. All right, um, so um, the actual um, end result here of the Fifth Amendment being used to protect data is actually up in arms. Uh, because there is a case that had been ongoing um, that I think has since been settled, but didn't necessarily settle the legal question involved. So the case here, an individual was stopped by police, um, had a mobile phone and was arrested. The officer did the whole I smell marijuana thing. And um, you can either wait for a dog. It might take a couple hours uh, or you can just let me search the car. He said, I'll wait for the dog, which pissed the cop off. Dog came out, there was a hit, they searched the car, and uh, I think they ended up finding a very small amount of marijuana. Uh, but during that stop, um, the officer, of course, arrested him, handcuffed him, emptied his pockets, and did that whole deal. And while the officer was um, in the middle of all of this, the phone was out on the trunk of the police cruiser. And um, the phone was locked, but there was a notification that came up and it was a message from one of his contacts that was known to him. So it was somebody who was in the phone. It wasn't like a random number that came up. Uh, and the text message just said, oh, all that was readable on the notification was, did they find it? And so the police <laughs> harangued him for several hours. Unlock your phone. We want to see what this is. Unlock your phone. We want to see what this is. Um, he refused. He said, I don't remember my password. I forgot. The judge wasn't buying it either and ordered him to unlock his phone and he continued to refuse and he was found in contempt of court and was sent. When you're, if you ever go to court, do what the judge says because they can essentially put you in jail for contempt of court for any reason for pretty much, as long as they want, pretty much, honestly. Uh, 
I mean, there's some fighting it, but generally speaking, the judge can do what they want. And so finding him in contempt of court, I think he spent six months in prison for it, something like that. And every time they asked him for it, I just forgot. I forgot my password. I forgot it. Um, they tried to compel him to divulge that under the auspices of it being discovery, not investigation, because they, they say they knew that it contained evidence. And by not providing his password, it was obstruction of justice. That's why it's ongoing, because whether that's true or not is a legal decision that has yet to be determined, which is why make sure your phone has certain features you take advantage of. For example, the cop lock. If you like to have your notifications on your phone, the cop lock, if you press the power button three times in quick succession, um, it basically puts it into like a sleep mode where it turns off, no, do not disturb. Turns on do not disturb, turns on bedtime mode, turns on um, sleep mode, and it, it, you'll, get a, you'll get a gray screen and the clock is about it. Um, encryption is also salient here because it's the same deal. Uh, another case here, a woman, uh, USB fricassee. And in this case, the woman refused to divulge the password to a partial disk encryption container um, because Fifth Amendment grounds, it might be incriminating, that kind of thing. But this case was settled, and this is how the argument for that previous case in Florida works. They say it's discovery because in this case, it was discovered. They, she had already admitted in interview that she had files in question that the government was seeking, but she refused to divulge the password to decrypt those files. So she had already provided testimony. She already admitted that she had the information and she just refused to decrypt it. So in that case, it was definitely discovery. They already knew the contents of the files. They just had to get them themselves and she refused to provide the password. So she, she gets in trouble for this one. So if it's the process of discovery, yes, you can be forced to divulge a password, even if it's only known to you. If it's the process of investigation, you do not, because that would be considered incriminating. You are not yet at that point criminal. All right, so the uh, Fifth Amendment does not protect against the production of non-testimonial evidence. Uh, that's the difference between discovery and investigation, non-testimonial evidence. So, um, like for example, if, uh, if you have a note with your password on it, you can't plead the fifth on the note. You can only plead the fifth on your testimony. You can't provide testimony that would otherwise incriminate. Um, uh, the exception to that is the Fifth Amendment does protect against the production of evidence that discloses the contents of a defendant's mind, including his or her beliefs and knowledge. That comes out of several uh, cases that went to the Supreme Court during the Red Scare. Uh, if you're familiar with the late 50s and 60s, the uh, McCarthy era and so on, um, Congress subpoenaed many individuals in order to determine whether or not they were part of the Red Menace. And uh, as evidence in those cases, Congress also subpoenaed those who had access to, for example, the accused diary and so on. And so pleading the fifth, McCarthy would say, well, this is documentary evidence. We have your diary. Well, all the way up to the Supreme Court on a couple of those determining that something that personal does essentially reflect testimonial evidence as provided under the Fifth Amendment. Although, honestly, there have been several cases on the Fifth Amendment grounds where it's not so clear what is included in the contents of a defendant's mind beliefs or knowledge could be any number of things. Basically what I'm saying is don't test it. If you have a diary that's got secrets, keep them secret. Don't tell anybody, including your diary. All right, now onto the Sixth Amendment. Hopefully, yeah, I think we can close this out today. A little bit slower than I thought, but that's fine. All right, so the Sixth Amendment, not as famous as the first, fourth, or fifth, of course. But an important one nonetheless, particularly in an era of mass communications, this is the amendment that provides you essentially an impartial jury. Uh, the question is, is it even possible to have an impartial jury in an era where information moves as fast and uncontrollably as it does in our world? Well, that is a complicated question for political scientists and criminologists alike. But the answer, of course, is no. 
but we try anyway. So for example, oh God, that's a fucking mess. <laughs> Why? <laughs> It, it is my doing, but I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up this, in this place. Let's see. All right, let's do this. There we go. All right, so to safeguard the Sixth Amendment rights, we require an impartial jury where jurors are expected and instructed to set aside preconceptions, disregard extrajudicial influences, and decide guilt or innocence based only on the evidence presented in court. The bar, if again, you're only familiar with the legal process from police procedurals for civil cases, so where somebody is sued, the evidence presented in court should be considered up to a preponderance of the evidence. So essentially, the trier of fact is meant to determine whether or not a plaintiff or defendant is um, probably, probably culpable in a certain case. Um, so like 51% preponderance of the evidence. Whereas for criminal cases, the evidence presented is considered to beyond a shadow of a doubt. Meaning that the trier of fact, jury or judge in this case, uh, must essentially be absolutely certain. 99% certain will say um, that things did, or the evidence does show that things occurred according to the narrative presented in court. Now, as I mentioned, juries are instructed, if you've never had an opportunity to do jury duty, I recommend it, it's a lot of fun. What's that? Yeah, it's kind of like a lottery. You can only be selected once every four years, and if you're selected, you don't necessarily sit on a jury. Once you register for selective service, um, oh, wait, that can't be, wait, hold a second. How do they get, it's got to be by taxpayer ID. That's the only thing that makes sense. I had heard when I, when I was in my L1 classes, my pre-law classes, that it was selective service, but then it can't be because then women would never be called for jury duty. <laughs> so that can't be it. Uh, no, it's got to be taxpayer ID. But yeah, you're, you're assigned into a jurisdiction, and uh, a circuit court. Uh, the circuit court system randomly draws your, your name um, in their system, and then you'll receive a letter that says you've been selected for jury duty, appear at this time in this place, and so on. Um, so you'll go there, and you'll sit around most of the morning, and then they will, again, randomly draw your number um, out of the system because they'll call far more jurors than they actually need because some people don't bother to show up at all. Um, and if you're one of those few people that are selected, then you get to sit down for a while and you'll be interviewed by both counsel and in some cases the judge hops in as well. They'll ask questions as to your impartiality, your knowledge of the case and so on. And if for any reason uh, you're determined not to be a suitable juror in this case, you'll be dismissed. And then one of the other people who wasn't initially called will be randomly called up and, and the same process will, will go throughout. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons why a juror, a potential juror rather, uh, might be dismissed. Um, essentially, each side gets a certain number that they can dismiss without cause. So essentially, they don't like your career path, they don't like your face, uh, they don't like the way you, you know that you walked into the courtroom they can dismiss you, but they get a limited number of those. Uh, the rest of them beyond that, um, they have to be for some reason uh, dismissed with cause. So something like you've answered a question that reveals a bias or something like that along those lines. So yeah, it depends. And there are certain cases where they like a side or another may assume a bias if you're like an engineering student. Like for example, a lot of traffic accident cases. Um, one of the things that's most at issue in those cases is the speed of travel. And if you're an engineering student, they don't want you back in the juror room confusing everybody by talking about force and velocity and whatnot. Because right? the, the, the adage in the legal game is, is that a jury is uh, made up of 12 people that couldn't figure out how to get out of jury. So, um, and, I, and I've presented evidence in court and I know people who have as well. One of the things that we struggle with the most is explaining technical topics to a jury 
doesn't maybe even necessarily understand how the microwave works or how to operate it, um, who think that when you click on the IE icon, you're opening the internet kind of a thing. So, you know, how do you demonstrate that? And I mean, legitimately, I've talked to, um, to FBI agents that do this for a living. Um, and, uh, and we were like, well, why don't you just, just ship a T? Because the other problem is if, if you're providing testimony nationwide, uh, a New York City courtroom is going to have certain resources that the Ninth Circuit of Bumfuck, Kansas won't have. Um, so you go in there and they have CRT TVs and the, you know, that kind of thing. Like they still have the overhead projectors and stuff. So, you know, it's like, why don't you just mail yourself a 30 inch TV or something like that? And then you can set it up yourself. And the answer I got was we've considered that, but there's never any outlets. So, uh, so yeah, anyway. Um, right. So yeah, uh, when you're on a jury, you're instructed to be impartial. You're instructed uh, even sometimes you can be sequestered, which means that you're essentially kept out of the public. You're not to go home or anything like that. You go to a hotel, they'll cut off the cable, uh, they'll take your phone and that kind of a thing. But that is on the extreme end of things. And that's up to the discretion of the judge in these cases to make those determinations and limitations on jurors. And by necessity, they try to make them as... Um, as easy as possible, right? They don't want to sequester, we, we could. As soon as something happens, uh, we can sequester some jurors in advance, uh, call them, them, anybody that makes it through, throw them in a hotel for a year um, and not allow them access to the internet or anything. We could probably have a pretty impartial jury, um, but nobody wants to do that. And everyone already dreads jury duty. So the last thing they want to do is make it even worse. So the question is, is that in this case where jurors have access to the internet, they're talking to their friends, they're going on social media, they're watching the news and so on. Uh, can we have an impartial jury? And uh, again, the answer uh, is that, what? why? There we go. Uh, the answer is that no, we really can't. We really cannot have a Sixth Amendment viable um, case in the United States. Even small cases get an inordinate amount of attention, particularly if they happen to be interesting cases, right? Um, when I served on jury duty, it was not a very interesting case. I, I had not heard of it. It was just here in Stevens Point, and it was um, a, a case uh, where there was a, let's see, what was it? a truck uh, belonging to a local business was involved in an accident. And uh, the defendant alleged that they were under the influence at the time. Um, it was just one of those. I hadn't heard of it before. But even small cases these days, were, like I said, we were already talking about the Alex Jones case. We know of several others just like that. No, we, we can't. Um, the survey here, right? What happens when a juror is caught, for example, um, violating their instructions? Yes. Uh, it was after I moved into my new house, uh, 2016, 2017 or so. Um, right, so what happens? Well, again, that's up to the discretion of the judge. Uh, we can't simply remove jurors who violate these, these uh, rules and because uh, if we did mistrials, we'd constantly be needing new jurors all the time. Uh, most of the time they just get a warning Occasionally, we do get a mistrial. Occasionally, there are recompense uh, for the juror. But again, the more people we punish for doing this kind of thing, the less likely people are going to want to serve on the jury. So that tends to not happen so much. Usually, they're just replaced by an alternate. Or if something weird happens, the judge decides they're going to do this. And this is particularly a big problem for really large cases that everyone knows about, right? For Chelsea Manning or Edward Snowden. Right? Can we even have a theoretically impartial trial for people like that? And the simple answer, and the only one I have, it's not very satisfying right now, is no, we can't, but we try and you know, we kind of do the best we can, which is a terrible thing to say to an amendment in the Bill of Rights. Right? We do the best we can. We can't really do it, but I guess you get what you get. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. I'm not sure that we'll ever see a day uh, when Edward Snowden actually goes on trial. It's still possible. 
He was recently granted uh, Russian citizenship just in time to be drafted to go to Ukraine, I note. Um, but yeah, um, he may still eventually come back to the United States. And if he does, uh, I can guarantee that he will not be forgiven for what he did. Does everybody, you, you, you've all heard of Edward Snowden. Does everybody know exactly what he did? No? Um, so Edward Snowden uh, was a contractor uh, for the United States military. He was a computer guy. Uh, the DOD uh, hires a lot, a lot of contractors, uh, particularly when it comes to technology. Now, the, the DOD, they, of course, they have their own programs um, and their, their own staff and so on. And their risk tolerance, their risk appetite in the DOD is effectively zero. So you'd think that they wouldn't bring on contractors unless they had to, but that's how much work they need done. They, it's the military and they don't have enough people to do it. So they hire contractors to do it, especially for uh, specific things uh, like uh, security and intelligence, like Edward Snowden specialized in. Um, so he uh, became, in his capacity as a contractor, came across documents from the National Security Agency, the CIA and other intelligence organizations uh, and he became privy to the truth, and this is not this is not a political statement. This is not in <laughs> controversy whatsoever that the intelligence agencies of the United States government have been spying on United States citizens, which is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, not only that, but the NSA uh, was keeping some really uh, nasty secrets to themselves, uh, like, for example, um, back doors into just about every computer system, hard coded at the factory, right? So the NSA would make deals with chip manufacturers and so on to embed code that they could exploit uh, in the systems, uh, including mobile devices, desktops, and so on. Um, they also had the ability uh, in a data analytics sense, well, you know, hell, let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, take a look at the list, huh? Um, Okay. Um, so yeah, he found this information and he leaked it to uh, WikiLeaks, uh, trying to notify the United States public um, to what these agencies were up to. For example, how U.S. intelligence funding uh, works out, which is considered proprietary government information. Um, the NSA is shown to be secretly accessing Google and Yahoo data centers to collect information from hundreds of millions of account holders worldwide by tapping undersea cables using the muscular surveillance system. The NSA loves their acronyms, guys. They had all kinds of them. Quantum squirrel. Uh, let's see what was another one. Turbine, quantum hand. They love their acronyms. What does it mean? I bet it's, I bet it's terrifically tortured. It's got to be. Uh, quantum insert, quantum hand, quantum theory, quantum bot, quantum copper, and so on. Um, so if you're not familiar uh, with, uh, with what precisely was leaked, I do recommend you look into it. Um, it's one of the reasons why, <laughs> I guess to circle back, the dangerous or undesirable speech, it's one of the reasons why it's so pervasive online and so difficult to combat. I don't understand why Lane Davis was so involved with the Pizzagate conspiracy when there are actual horrible things actually going on for real <laughs> that you can get plenty upset about and rant about online if you want to. <laughs> you don't have to make things up. The truth is bad enough. All right, let's call it for today. We'll, do, uh, we'll get into digital citizenship next time. Take care.